The World Canine Organization recognizes 349 different dog breeds, displaying every imaginable shape, color, and size. But despite these physical differences, they all share over 99% of their genes with each other. And not only with each other, they also share 99% of them with this animal too, the wolf. He's an apex predator in his environment, the top of the food chain, afraid of no one. So how did this become this? A clue to the answer may be found in a tiny difference between the facial musculature of wolves and dogs. And it has to do with that enigmatic quality we call cuteness. Meet Lucy. Right now, she's doing something wolves can't do. She's raising her eyebrows. We've all seen dogs do it. It even has a name, puppy eyes. But just how dogs can do this was only recently revealed in a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The paper demonstrates that the musculature surrounding the eye differs in dogs compared to wolves. In particular, the LAOM muscles just above the eyebrows and the RAOL muscles on the side, right there and right there, um, are more present in dogs than they are in wolves, suggesting that dogs might be using their eyebrows expressively, trying to potentially communicate with us. But knowing how a dog can do this doesn't answer the question why they do it. And the answer to that question may lie in how dogs were domesticated in the first place. A hint can be found in the fact that there is one breed of domesticated dog that also can't raise its eyebrows. The Husky. Huskies are genetically closer to wolves than any other breed of dog. And like wolves, they don't possess the muscles in their eyebrows that other dogs do. One of the authors of the scientific paper that described this unexpected difference between wolves and dogs is Professor Rui Diogo, seen here with a husky yes, so, called uh, Wolfie. Uh, Wolfie is a husky and is one of the more uh, ancestral lines, genetically and morphologically. And what we saw when we dissected huskies is that they don't have these muscles as developed as other dogs. All the other dogs include chihuahuas, they had it, and chihuahuas are very ancestral also. But huskies cannot do the puppy eyes. So if I, if I do this, he wants it, but he will not do those puppy eyes. Like, oh, please, I'm dying without it, you know? That is a big difference that huskies seemingly cannot do. It's now thought that huskies didn't develop puppy eyes because they never needed them. We selected them for the things we wanted them to do, like pulling sleds in the Arctic not for companionship. They can be cute, but they really don't interact so much. They don't care so much about humans. So they are, in theory, more detached than other dogs that were really raised to be company dogs. We don't call them, right, company dogs. That's, that's the main difference. And companionship was certainly not on the minds of the wolves when they first began to pay attention to us. It's thought that even before the first agricultural revolution, at the end of the last ice age, wolves began to tag along with our nomadic ancestors, hunting the same animals that we were hunting. Biologists call it commensalism, literally eating at the same table. But when our ancestors stopped migrating and started to build permanent encampments, a profound change in our relationship to wolves began to occur. We actually don't know when the change would have started to occur. Domestication is controversial. We don't know when it happened, we don't really know where it happened, and we don't really know how it happened. It may have been the case that a sort of ancestral dog wolf may have incurred some sort of evolutionary benefit from interacting with humans. In particular, this may have been some sort of access to resources that they didn't have before. 
as humans live in certain areas and potentially become sedentary, we have offal, we have trash, we have rubbish. And as a predator and a carnivore, you potentially no longer have to waste or expel a lot of energy in finding available food resources. You can just eat the scraps that human left behind. But it seems like the interaction might be more mutually beneficial. Humans may have benefited from having a dog-like ancestor around in terms of protection or, in a sense, a way to have other predators be scared off. So this could essentially be the evolution of a guard dog. And so the descendant that you have at home, this dog that's cute and cuddly, is very different from a wolf-like ancestor from 14,000 years ago. A key insight into how dogs became cute and cuddly came in the latter part of the 20th century, when a Russian geneticist decided to breed silver foxes solely on the basis of their tameness and lack of aggression. The results were dramatic and unexpected. This is a lovely experiment where since the 1950s they have been in a sense, selecting um, for evolutionary traits related to tameness or interaction with humans. And we see that in roughly 10 or so generations that not only do behavioral changes arise, but also physical features seem to change. The experiment with the silver foxes showed that we were just selecting for tameness. And some of this cuteness comes as a byproduct for tameness. The byproduct is the, the ears like that. These are not normal for a mammal because the ears are always erect, right? But in dogs and tame foxes, they, the, the ears get curved. The air has uh, strange colors, a mix of colors. Uh, the snout gets smaller, the teeth got smaller. So again, it's more juvenileized. But that was not selecting for the, those characters themselves or for the tameness. It's a byproduct that came, we call it the domestication syndrome. But how could this domestication syndrome connect such an apparently unrelated range of characteristics, like floppy ears, small teeth, varying coat color, and aggression? The answer is to be found in the earliest stages of development in the pup embryo. And specifically, it relates to a group of multipotent stem cells called neural crest cells. These cells migrate throughout the developing embryo to form muscle, cartilage, and skin pigment cells. They also form the adrenal glands. These are the glands that produce adrenaline, a key chemical in the body's fight or flight system, and a key component in aggressive behavior. What's now known is that by repeatedly selecting for tame foxes, the Russian scientists were unwittingly selecting animals with smaller adrenal glands, and as a byproduct, a reduction in all the other neural crest cell characteristics. The result was what we would describe today as cuteness. For the ancestral dogs, this cuteness byproduct would pay off handsomely because it perfectly matched another genetically inherited trait that humans possess. We love babies. Can't help ourselves. It's hardwired into our genes. And we're not alone in this regard. Throughout the animal kingdom, if a species is to survive, its members need to be able to pass on their genes to the next generation. Over time, ever more complex mating rituals have evolved to ensure that only the fittest are successful. Those rituals are driven by a family of hormones that not only trigger the distinctive behaviors that encourage mating, they also prepare the mother's body for conception, birth, and care of the young. One of the primary hormones, versions of which can be found in fish, reptiles, birds, and mammals, is oxytocin. In humans, oxytocin performs a range of functions, from strengthening the contractions of the womb during childbirth to promoting milk production after childbirth. It's also been known to play an important role in human behavior, including sexual arousal, trust, anxiety, and mother-infant bonding. As a result, oxytocin has been called the love hormone, or cuddle chemical, and it can be released simply by looking at a baby. Well, I think cuteness, cuteness is really what I'm holding right here. 
Um, and cuteness is incredibly... <laughs> Cuteness is incredibly important for us as a species. Um, so back in the early 1900s, Conrad Lorenz, one of the early ethologists, people that study animal behavior, introduced the idea that there might be certain physical features that are particularly cute and endearing that we are attracted to. They would have a high and protruding forehead, very big eyes. She has mushy, big cheeks. She has a little nose and a little mouth, and they'd have short, pudgy extremities. And that all of these features would essentially elicit our attraction and our caretaking. So it's really worked. I mean, it, it definitely, you're definitely cute. What's also notable is oxytocin, the hormone that's really associated with social bonding and affiliation. When I look at Olympia and she looks at me, we both get increases in, our, in, in levels of oxytocin. And when you look at the dog-human relationship, especially with dogs and their owners, when they're looking at each other and interacting with each other in an enjoyable manner, you see similar um, increases. What's interesting is that this idea of um, infantile schema, this infantile appearance that we're attracted to, um, it can be easily co-opted. And nowhere has that co-opting been more obvious than in the world of cartoons. Long before Conrad Lorenz suggested that baby features are powerful emotional triggers, animators were already instinctively applying them to their characters. So big eyes, you know, button nose. These children have like bigger heads, the smaller bodies, you know, all the things that we kind of, in animation, use as proportions for our, uh, for our drawings. The basic proportions are where you start. Rounded shapes, larger head, everything starts with simple shapes. And traditionally, rounder edges, softer edges, softer shapes is cuteness. So if we were gonna draw just a generic head, and then from that, we can sort of place where the eyes may be. I like to start with the eyes because the eyes are very important in animation. A lot of expression is told specifically through the eyes, but traditionally, like a cute character, they generally have like smaller noses. Mm -hmm. Cute mouth, chubby cheeks, some rounded ears, and you can really start to play with the appeal of the character expression. The eyebrows go hand in hand with the eyes. They're sort of one. They allow you to really show the expression of a character with just a simple change. All right, I feel like this is a familiar baby. You get the idea. I don't know, what should, we, what should we call him or her? How about Bob? This newly created character that Steve calls Bob has all the baby feature characteristics that Conrad Lorenz identified over 70 years ago characteristics that can be easily transformed into a cute puppy with only a few strokes of Steve Karp's pen. So you kind of would start with the same basic shape again, right? Uh, a lot of it's the same. So the shapes are similar to what was appealing in humans. But you get the basic idea. And just as with real dogs, it's the eyes that can command attention in animation. And you can do a lot with eyes, so say we have a pair of eyes, right? General, friendly looking eyes, but just looking off to the left a little bit is, is, is a lot different than if they're looking straight at you. You kind of get a different uh, sense. Or changing the eyebrow a little bit in the placement of the eyes. Someone could be thinking, right? As opposed to how upset they are with the other person or something like this. Seething, right? Really angry. So the eyes being a very, very important part of the detail and animation, trying to emote and relate to the audience. We're angry. Happy to get along. Working on a problem. So where the pupils look, where the eyebrows are makes a big difference. I mean, they're obviously an exaggeration of our human features, but 
I feel like being able to communicate through the eyes is the most important thing in animation. And I mean, animals, or at least my dog, they really have this emotive, their eyes. You know, you can like feel them. You can almost see them processing. You can see their emotion right on their face. At the Thinking Dog Center in New York, researchers have been studying the ways dogs and humans interact and have come to realize that eye contact may be key to how we connect with our four-legged friends. Humans like to look at eyes, and so for us, our attention is immediately drawn to a face when we look at the eyes itself. And so when we're looking at a dog, we might be looking at those same areas. And for dogs, when it comes to communicating with humans, they might want to emphasize their cute little puppy dog eyes so that we actually are more attentive to them. Dogs are very, very good at understanding human gestures. Hey, good job, buddy. It may be the case that because of the fact that they have evolutionarily developed in such close proximity to humans, that they have developed a social understanding of how to communicate with us. This has all hijacked onto a pre-existing system. We love babies. We like looking at babies. There are certain things about babies that make them cute. And so by hijacking onto a pre-existing system, Dogs have developed features that resemble babies, and we have, in a sense, artificially selected to breed for those traits in dogs as well. We see them as babies. We want to care and nurture them as infants, and that's potentially hijacking onto these existing maternal lines. And nowhere is that more evident than at your local pet adoption center. It can be a case of cuteness overload. We see it on a day-to-day on -day basis, that immediate attraction. Your, um, like your yellow labs, your, your fluffy dogs, they do tend to go pretty quickly. But surprisingly sometimes, I would say friendliness sells. You know, that what makes the, the dog different than the wolf being their sociability, really, it's that dog that, that goes up to you, that wants you to pick them. And even in the hurly burly of an adoption center, full of yapping puppies, it's still the case that the eyes have it. I think both with animals and with people, there's a certain element of trust that you feel with eye contact. You feel kind of an endearment, a connection, um, kind of, you know, eyes are, what, eyes are the window into the soul. I can say having a three-year-old dog and having a three-year-old child, they equally demand my attention and I equally give it. You know, I get puppy eyes from either one. I mean, the head drops down, the eyes get wider, and whatever you want. You can have whatever you, <laughs> you want. Yeah. And even if they don't know, they seem to the moment they've done it once correctly, they're oh, like, oh, this worked, this, let's do it again. Yes. <laughs> Clearly, being cute does work for both babies and puppies, and it has done for many millennia thanks to a fortuitous convergence of shared instincts and genetic good fortune, wolves became mankind's best friend, and we became theirs. Some scientists have even suggested that maybe dogs and humans selected and domesticated each other.